clear in your new story about everything. What, what were you doing during these four minutes? I, I disagree with your assertion about every detail. I don't recall. I know that I was getting up and I was leaving. I was going to check on my mom. But specifically what I was doing, I don't, I, I don't know. I know what I wasn't doing, Mr. Waters, and what I wasn't doing is doing anything uh, as I believe you've implied that I was cleaning off or washing off or washing off guns or putting guns in a raincoat, and I can promise you that I wasn't doing any of that. What a matchup, but not classic cross-examination by Creighton Waters. No, no, and he took a little bit of heat for it, too, by the way. Uh, very open-ended and let Alec Murdoch talk. And what we found out as Chanley Painter sat down with Creighton Waters is that all of this was done on purpose. Take a listen. The crosses I went in was gonna be different from a traditional cross. And I think if you tried to do this like a traditional cross, it would not have gone as well. I also knew that starting out, I was going to be cut off by the evening recess, and I was essentially going to have to start from scratch because it's a, you know it's a process as you want to have that conversation. You do want to make it uh, have him answer difficult questions over a long period of time. So I also had to get to a stopping place and not sort of cross over into new territory because I knew I was going to be starting over. But the main point was to get him talking. I knew I've been. Uh, investigating and studying this man for a long time. I've had experience with people like him who are confident in their ability to come into a room and talk their way out of any trouble to dominate that room. And I, I was always confident he would testify because I didn't think he could resist that temptation, nor would he, uh, you know, have any lack of faith in his ability to do so. And so the idea was to get him talking. I mean, there were, there were pauses that were intentional because he couldn't help himself. He'd start talking again and then, oh, there's something new we can talk about. Uh, and, you know, you saw him sort of, uh, the wheels turning and I knew if I did it long enough, there was going to be new lies that he told along the way. And that's really what I wanted the jury to see because he had looked them in the eyes and been so compelling uh, as the trial lawyer that he was. Um, but then I wanted them to see that he could do it to them just as easily as he'd done it to everybody else, uh, look them in the eye and, and be very convincing, but also to watch him lie in, in real time. Fascinating approach. Some, some would say a little risky, but uh, it worked. It absolutely worked. Uh, let's bring back in Eric Bland and Matt Harris with us. Eric, uh, he did take a little bit of heat, right, from some of the talking heads and people saying, hey, what are you doing on cross? Alec Murdoch is controlling the courtroom, uh, but all this was done on purpose by him. Yeah, they don't teach this in trial advocacy. In trial advocacy, we're taught, pick your five best subjects, hit them, get them to admit it, and then sit down. You know, both sides violated that uh, brevity rule in cross-examination and did two, three-hour cross-examinations, which are just not favored there you know you could get yourself in real trouble you can uh gain ground but then up then end end up losing ground um but he took a risk and he wanted to get alex to talk and he felt that the more alex talked the more alex the true alex would come out and i thought we saw the true alex on friday we saw the actor alex on thursday but the true alex the liar, the the manipulator, came out when we, when they started getting really tight on those murder questions and the timeline, and he changed his story on when he touched Maggie and Paul from before 911 to after 911. So I think Alex got comfortable on the witness stand um, and got too comfortable that when it got uncomfortable, he showed being uncomfortable. Matt, what did you think of the dynamic between Creighton Waters and Alec Murdoch in this lengthy cross-examination? Well, a, a few things. One is Creighton was great at giving that pause. There was many times Alec stopped. You know, it would have been like a logical place to not keep talking. And then Creighton would pause. And then it goes Alex some more. Uh, <laughs> it's like he has to know, fill the. It's like he's a guest on a show where he's got to fill fill the blank space. Yeah. Or you're 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 doing a podcast and you hit a point and someone's like, well, I better talk. And and Alex yeah. would take the bait. Yeah, he'd say like, yesterday was Tuesday, right? Be like, yes, it was Tuesday. Crate would pause to go. 
And you know what I did on Tuesday? <laughs> you know, it, it was, it, we just, and we, we've talked about this with you, Vinny. I've talked with you about Alec cannot control himself as far as control, what he believes is controlling the narrative. It doesn't matter if it goes way back to, which Eric will, I'm sure, agree with this, back to this, the Satterfield case where Alec was running around talking about the dogs right out of the gate, controlling the narrative, the boating accident, the, uh, the, the crime scene this night, uh, any number of situations. He can't help himself. You see him in the police car or <laughs> the law enforcement car is talking. He can't help himself. He will talk. He just like vomits up words. Even his attorneys are around him, and we're like, why don't they stop him? I don't think they can. It's just bleh, bleh, words, words. You know what he should have done? Instead of annihilating his family, he should have just started a podcast with all this. <laughs> with this yeah, incredible. Eric and I. Thank you, Vinny. <laughs> Thank you for that. Matt and I don't appreciate that. Matt, no, I'm we serious. don't appreciate that. No, no. Yeah. I have a podcast too, by the way. In fact, <laughs> the latest episode of the Court TV podcast drops tonight at midnight. It's a good one. Chanley Painter joins me for the conclusion of the Murdoch family murders. And, and they don't believe me. Here's a preview. This case for this prosecutor, Creighton Waters and his team, was built almost, almost exclusively on the words of Alec Murdoch. Things that he has said since June 7th and some things that he said before June 7th, but things that he said were the case. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I off base here, Chair? No, I completely agree with you, and people I've spoken to agree. The big lie, he had laid out this story. He was not at the kennel. He was not at the kennel. He was not at the kennels, and suddenly he was at the kennels. There's video proof of that because it seems to be a consensus that was the strongest piece of evidence for prosecutors and even jurors have cited that who's spoken since the verdict. All right, download that podcast, and you download Impact of Influence and Cup of Justice, and you are, you, are, you are set. That's all you need in the world of podcasting. All right, coming up next hour. On the docket tonight in Palm Beach County, Florida, the killer clown trial, Sheila Keen Warren accused of dressing up like a clown, killing Marlene Warren, then marrying her husband. We have a preview of this highly anticipated trial on Court TV. I just have to keep going, you know, keep going. I want the truth and, you know, uh, an end to this tragic thing. There was pounding on the door, bang, bang, bang. He said that we'd seen his face and there was no way that he could ever let us go. I survived because I'm a born fighter. I survived tonight, 10, 9 central on Court TV. Murder on Music Row. He's going to expose this chart-fixing scheme. The death that sent shockwaves through Nashville. He did not want to be part of it. Someone they knew with Cameron Hall. All new episode tomorrow, 7, 6 central. It's hard to get around. Uh, you know, being at the murder scene with the victims just moments before they died and then lying about it. Um, you know, what, what innocent person uh, does that? And of course, we explored all various possibilities, but the roads all came back to Alec. Uh, you know, people can speculate, you know, and, and they have tried to speculate about, you know, Mexican cartels and all this other stuff. There was absolutely no evidence of any of that. Um, the, the perfect storm that arrived uh, was Alec. You're confident he's the only one responsible. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And he's right. There has been speculation about all these other potential suspects or ways that this could have been done, that maybe he was there, but somebody else was actually shooting his wife and son. Creighton Water's not buying any of that. Um, here he is talking more about, again, the biggest piece of evidence in the case, the kennel video and the big lie. <laughs> The murder case and the white collar cases uh, really started to converge and come to a peak. And uh, so then you have to think, all right, how are we going to tell this story in, in a seamless way? This case was unlike a normal murder case. You know, if Alec wasn't the killer, he would be our first wit you know, witness, the grieving father who uncovered this scene. Uh, but it was important for me to start out of the gate and play his voice, play that 911 call, play that Daniel Green body cam, play those uh, interviews for the jury. I wanted them to learn his voice. 
because they were going to hear the kennel video and it was going to be undeniable. People might have wondered, why do they keep bringing up this kennel video and having people over and over and over and over again identify it? Well, it's because that defendant had, uh, had said uh, that Rogan was wrong and I was never there. And he never once admitted that he was there until you saw him that Thursday, him get on the stand and, and try to tell this jury what was clearly a, a fabrication. Would have been such a different case without that kennel video, different trial, perhaps a different verdict. But the kennel video existed. Let's bring back in Eric Bland, Matt Harris. Um, here's the question I have for both of you from your perspectives. Before, uh, before that kennel video is, is, is uncovered, um, what was the talk down there? What, what were people saying about this case? What were they saying about Alec and his potential uh, alibi and where he was that night before that kennel video? I'll start with you, Matt. Well, I, I think everything turned for sure against Alec after the Labor Day assisted suicide, whatever you want to call it. I think that, the, you know, it was kind of a split maybe, or maybe people thinking that he did it. But after Labor Day, I mean, that is when it really became, okay, the majority of people down there probably thought he did it or had something to do with it. He wasn't the Alec Murdoch maybe they thought he was, because that's when the, really the stuff started pouring out. And Eric did his great job with the Satterfields. All that stuff happened post the, you know, whatever that was on Labor Day weekend with Cousin Eddie. So that changed everything. But as far as convicting him, I think it would have been a much longer haul for the prosecution if they didn't have that lie. Yeah, what are your thoughts, uh, Eric? I don't think they would have ever charged them without that video. Um, Jim Griffin was um, steadfast in saying he was not there. He said it in a number of different forums, you know, HBO. He said it on a news program. It was, um, you know, there was a lot of frustration on the population in South Carolina. What, what, why are you dragging? What is so slow? And obviously they were waiting to crack that phone from Paul and it turned out it was uh, his birth date. They tried to toggle it and they couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. And then, you know, two months later, they bring the murder charges in June of 2022. I, if they can't place him at that murder scene, um, I don't know if they would have brought the charges because there was really no scientific evidence matching him there. Yeah, that is so true. And by the way, so he admits that he was there on the trial in his testimony. But uh, Matt, if if there's no video, he never would have admitted it. And if he got on the stand, he would have lied about it. I mean that. Well, he I think we all know. We all know that, right? He wouldn't have got. On he the wouldn't stand. have got on the stand. He just would not have got on the stand. There was no reason to get on the stand if he wasn't trying to defend the lie. So he would never would have been on the stand. And one of the big parts of how they got it through the grand jury was the blood spatter on the shirt, which we then learned <laughs> they didn't even use in their uh, you know prosecution because whatever there's many reasons why it didn't work out. But if you threw that out, there, there's there's nothing. Uh, nothing at all, except for, you know, he was an obvious suspect. Obvious, very obvious suspect, but, uh, the, you know, you have to prove it in a court. Things just change once you get inside that courtroom, and there's the standard of proof, and everyone's looking at it like this, and that's the way the system has to work. Um, we have, how much time do we have? We have about a minute left here. Um, so just give me your final thoughts in, in about 20 seconds or so, and I'll start with you, Eric, about what we all experienced down in South Carolina. What did we experience? Well, I think we're all processing it. It's kind of like what the Marines do an after action plan, figuring out what went right, what went wrong. You know, I'm, I'm still a little numb, but trying to figure out what the landscapes were gonna look like going forward. And you're right, Alex isn't gonna see uh, the light of day for a long, long time, if ever. Um, I think they're boxing him in. They're putting a foot on his throat. They're going to schedule Satterfield, and they're going to follow it up with two other easily provable uh, financial crime cases, and then they're going to get him l -whopped. And then they're going to make it. The Fed's got to make a decision. Matt, you have about 15 seconds to wrap this yeah. all up for us. Uh, I think we learned a lot about the law. If everybody's following court TV and doing this, you learned a lot about the law. You learned about how the defense works, how the prosecution works, and uh, I think it was a great lesson. Thank you, Vinny and Shanley, for all that, and Eric, too. 
All right, guys. You too, man. Appreciate your time. Eric Bland, Cup of Justice podcast. Download it after the show. And then download Murdoch Family Murders, Impact of Influence. <laughs> we'll be right back.